with that, I will introduce our longtime friend, Alan Weil, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, author, speaker, and most importantly, he's been a member of the, the Symposium family for about a decade now. So, Alan, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good morning. It's always great to be here. It's a decade, but actually, I go back to the days of the Montgomery Dorsey Symposium, the Dorsey Hughes Symposium. Uh, I have a few years off uh, in the interim, but it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, I am going to kick off this morning with a few comments before I introduce Brian, who's going to dig deeper into the subject matter. And the few minutes I'm going to spend are entitled, Why Health Affairs Covers Housing Policy and Why I'm Not Sure We Should. Um, and you might substitute a health foundation for health affairs, uh, just to give you a sense of why I'm giving you this perspective. For those of you not from my field, Health Affairs is the leading health policy journal in the country. We, in many ways, set the agenda for health policy discussions around the country. And uh, we have a long history of excellent uh, publication, but we are increasingly covering topics like housing. And that was not a simple decision to make. Uh, at one level, deciding to cover housing is a fairly obvious choice. On everyone's tongue in healthcare these days is the social determinants of health, a phrase I don't particularly care for, uh, but that's a different lecture. Um, so, Housing clearly is a determinant of health, and uh, increasingly we know within healthcare that actual medical services, healthcare services, only account for some say 20 or so percent of people's actual health. So if we're serious about understanding what makes people healthy, we need to look outside the bounds of healthcare and healthcare services, and as a health policy journal, we ought to be doing that as well. The linkages between housing and health are well documented. I could just read to you this brief uh, written by Lauren Taylor that we published, but it's on our website. It's available through uh, uh, the materials for the symposium. Uh, it's a brief funded actually by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation looking at an overview of the literature around the relationship between housing and health. And just to really give you the overview, um, the author describes four basic connections between housing and health. There's the stability connection, uh, homelessness, moving around a lot, housing volatility, housing uncertainty does definitely have a demonstrable negative effect on people's health and health status. Homelessness, we just uh, published a piece not long ago. It has lasting effects for children long after uh, the homelessness uh, is resolved. The second pathway is what she calls quality and safety. We have a long history of lead abatement, of concerns about uh, mold in homes causing uh, children's asthma. Uh, for older adults, we know that you have to do home modifications to reduce the rate of falls and hip uh, fractures and the like. Uh, and, and overall, the quality and safety of homes is very closely tied to health status. The third linkage she describes is affordability. We have 40 million people in this country who spend more than 30% of their income on housing, 20 million who spend more than half of their income on housing. Not surprisingly, those populations are disproportionately low income. The stresses that the financial burden of housing places on people and families that gets in the way of their ability to achieve other uh, objectives in their life are, are so profound that affordability in and of itself or the lack of affordability is a barrier to health. And then the fourth uh, pathway that she describes is the neighborhood pathway, safe neighborhoods, neighborhoods that lend themselves to physical activity, that have grocery stores, that, that support uh, social uh, services and social mixing and, and supports of each other when things are, when, when, when difficulties strike. All of these are related uh, to healthcare and health outcomes. So the, the evidence base 
to suggest that housing affects health is quite strong. It's stronger in some of those domains than others. Again, read the brief if you want more detail. And if you're interested in social determinants of health, housing is actually a pretty natural place to start. Um, first of all, housing is highly resourced. We in healthcare, you know, we're a sixth of the economy, we're a $3 trillion sector. Well, housing's right up there. It's well resourced, it's highly capitalized, strong private sector presence. Uh, in contrast to some other issue, social issues that we uh, uh, work on in healthcare, housing is a, is a mature uh, professional sector with lots of research, lots of analysis, and it's highly regulated. It's, uh, it has the involvement of government, particularly at the federal and local levels, some state policy as well. So if you, if you want an entry point into social determinants of health between the evidence base that we exists and the, the fact that housing is, is, a, is an area of significant research, for us it's a natural place uh, to enter. But I do have some concerns about our entry in this and I, I want to share them because, uh, because I think it's important to not just say, well, because housing and health is connected, we should all be, uh, work on housing. Um, a few years ago, if you were here, uh, I, I, I've always worried about sort of health being so broadly defined that every, if everything's health, then you know, nothing's health, and that doesn't really help us very much. So there are three reasons I worry about our entry into housing as a field for our journal. The first is I don't want us to be superficial. Uh, if you've read the journal, I hope super, superficial is not a term that would come to your mind. Uh, we go deep, we look and we analyze carefully, but we're not experts in housing. At a practical matter, we don't have good peer reviewers in housing. We don't know who the authors are in housing. And frankly, if you're an expert in housing and you have a blockbuster study, you're probably not going to want to publish it in a health policy journal. And so I worry that we, as we enter a new field, run the risk of skimming the surface, that the real knowledge and expertise about these issues resides elsewhere. We're sort of voyeuristic, and we don't really uh, grapple with the depth of the issue. And that's something, as a journal editor, I want to make sure we don't do. And that's related to a second concern I have, which is that I worry that the healthcare lens on topics can be distorting. So the question we ask when a paper comes in about housing and health is, what's the relationship between housing and health? But there are a lot of great questions in housing that are not about health. They're about housing. There's a whole field of housing research to figure out how to improve access and affordability of housing, improve the quality of housing, uh, zoning and regulation and codes and, and financing and all sorts of things that are not primarily about health. And so as we sort of carve out this what's the relationship topic, we run the risk of leaving behind or distorting our view of what is important in housing. Housing is important in and of itself, not just as a tool to improve health. And if we look at it as a health issue, we run the risk of losing it as a housing issue, which it certainly needs to be. And then I worry about what people will do with the work. Now that may seem like an odd thing to worry about, but let me explain what I mean. Again, particularly for those of you not in the healthcare field, why is there so much attention to social determinants right now? Because there are new payment models that I won't go into the details of that are designed to hold health systems accountable for the health outcomes of populations. And so instead of just getting paid for every healthcare service you provide, you get paid one way or another based on how healthy people are. And that leads you to ask what creates health and if housing creates health, then you think, well, we should invest in housing. That's the short version. But in that environment, the primary motivation and the primary action is what I would call panel management, meaning I'm an insurer or I am a health system 
and I have a bunch of enrollees or a bunch of patients, and one by one I identify that someone's health is compromised because their housing is unstable or of poor quality, and I intervene to try to improve the quality of that housing for that patient to improve their health. And for that patient, I have done a good thing, but I have not addressed a social determinant or a social phenomenon. I have mitigated my own risk by investing in my patient. And that is not transformative, it's just cost management. Now we do see examples, and some of them are mentioned in the, 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 uh, the brief that I described to you, of systems that are deeply entrenched in their communities investing in their community, not just person by person. And that's a positive outcome. But I just want us to be thoughtful about whether or not, as healthcare goes into housing, it's really going deeply enough into the roots of the issues. And I'll just say that everything healthcare touches becomes more expensive. And it's hard to believe we could do that with housing, but I don't want us to try. So let's be careful we don't health careify housing. So I do worry about whether we should do this, but in the end, of course, we are. And I want to close with a few thoughts on why I've overcome those worries that I have. The first is that housing is a window into history. You have to take the long view when you look at housing. Housing patterns are relatively stable. Housing investment is long term. Healthcare tends to focus on the latest, the innovation, the, 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 new, the new cool thing. And if you, if you start talking about housing, you have to slow down and you have to look backwards and really understand history, and that's a lot of what's gonna happen over these couple of days. And I think that's a good thing for healthcare. Housing offers a window into assets, and I'm gonna use that term in two different ways. One is, of course, most pe for most people who own a home, that is their largest asset. We do a lot of work in healthcare that slices and dices by income, and sometimes, of course, by race and ethnicity. Income disparities are large and growing and a huge concern, but asset disparities are even bigger by an order of magnitude. We don't have as good data on assets. We tend to focus on the 1% versus the 90%, but the 10% versus the 40%, the asset differences are much bigger than the income differences. So by talking about housing, we talk about assets and asset accumulation. And even the term asset, asset is viewed as a positive. You have assets. In healthcare, we tend to talk about deficits and curing. And so I think housing brings us some language that's helpful. Ultimately, I think talking about housing is a window into true social determinants, not panel management, but the real underlying determinants. And you're gonna hear a lot more detail about this, so I will just tee it up. The fact is housing disparities are deeply entrenched in racist policies. You cannot have a conversation about housing without talking about race, without talking about racism, without talking about public policies that have created and reinforced racist patterns. And in, in healthcare, we certainly talk about equity and inequity and disparities, but we're very polite. And many of you don't know that with the enactment of Medicare, we desegregated America's hospitals because you could not receive Medicare funding if you discriminated on the basis of race. And many people think, well, we kind of did that. Well, those of us who work in the field know that there's a lot more work to do. But fundamentally, I think by pointing people in healthcare to issues of housing, we get deeper into the social context in which disparities, inequities, and racism, and, and inequality uh, originate and are perpetuated and replicated. And I think it's healthy for the healthcare community to, to learn about that and to uh, uh, make a difference and try to improve because of that. So in the end, although I have concerns about how a health policy journal or maybe even a healthcare foundation enters the field of housing, 
In the end, I think we have to. I think there's a tremendous amount to learn, and let's learn it together. I just want to close. One of the great things about this symposium, and Karen always sets the stage, is we talk at a personal level. So I'm going to close with a real quick personal story. I'm the board, I'm a trustee of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, D.C. We're totally focused on race and eliminating uh, racial disparities. And we have, I'm on the board, and we have a board questionnaire to ask about our various attributes. And one of the questions is whether we have inherited wealth. And I thought, gee, that's sort of an odd question. And then as I thought about it, and I thought about my fellow trustees, I realized that even though my parents didn't buy a house, their first house, until I was in middle school because my father inherited some money from his parents' death, and although I have not inherited from my parents because, thankfully, they are still alive, there is a chain of equity that has built up in my white middle-class family that creates a cushion and a base of security that is not just financial, it is also emotional, and that millions and millions of Americans have systematically been deprived of that opportunity. And if those of us who have it fail to recognize that there are so many who don't, and that the reason they don't is because of policies that elected leaders of our parents and grandparents and sometimes ourselves at earlier ages put into place and reinforced, then we are not taking the issue seriously. So let's take the issue seriously together and spend the next couple of days trying to figure out what we can learn from it and help health and housing work together better to improve both housing and health for all of Coloradans. Thank you.